Good evening. Good evening and uh, welcome. Good evening to the welcome and to the Aspen Institute McCluskey series. There's Bonnie McCluskey. Let's thank her. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Marlene and Fred Malik, who are sitting next to him. Uh, they're the ones who helped bring this all together. He's the one who helped pull this. We had, uh, uh, this is our fourth year with the Republican governors. I had to apologize to a couple of the governors that I'm not moderating it, but I know there'll be a round of applause from everybody here who's heard me moderate far too often this summer and is sick of seeing me. So, uh, uh, but the important thing is, and we've done this with the Democratic governors too, is to notice when you hear them speak that the governors are really the good guys in this world. They're the people who can get things done. They're the people who make things work. Uh, it's astonishing to me when I see, I mean, I obviously have a partiality to my home state, Governor Bobby Jindal, but when I see him and Mitch Landrew, who you all saw earlier this summer, work together to create a new school system coming out of the tragedy we had of Katrina, I understand why governors and mayors are the real heroes of our country. I just wish some of you would go to Washington occasionally and tell them how to, uh, you know, get things done based on, on principle. They're here to talk about the challenges and the policies in their state, but before they do, I'm not sure I see them all here, but we do have some other governors in the audience and the lights are on my eyes, so if Jan Brewer, Governor Brewer, are you here? All right, and uh, we have uh, Sam, Bra oh, yes, uh, Sam Brownback of Kansas, where, where are they all? And I want to say, having said my thing about Washington, when Senator Brownback was there, man of great principle, but also somebody who really did have a passion and a care for many different uh, ways of making this country greater. So we do miss him in Washington. Tom Corbett of Pennsylvania, Nathan Deal of Georgia, a regular at the Aspen Institute now, Susanna Martinez of New Mexico, Butch Otter of Idaho, and one of our veterans here at the Aspen Institute, Governor Rick Perry. So thank you all very much. I hope you'll also join us next week. We have all the people from our Global Leaders Network, the Aspen Young Leaders, from around the world will be here from starting July 30th. Uh, we're going to have quite a few uh, public events connected to it. David Rubenstein, Tom Friedman, Madeleine Albright, Linda Resnick, myself, and others. So if you want to come to that, just get your tickets. You can uh, come to any of the public events or the patrons pass to come to all of the public events together. I think the patrons pass is our program, but I'd really love to see you all there. As I said, right when I was deciding that I had worked too hard this summer, John Martin called me and asked, hey, can I get a room in Aspen Meadows? It's sold out. I said, well, on one condition, you got to moderate the governors for me. Uh, John is a really cool guy. When they started Politico, I said, what were they thinking? But it ended up uh, creating one of the great uh, political new media uh, services of our time uh, for reasons that are inexplicable to me. He left Politico and is now the national political correspondent of the New York Times. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend John Martin. Thank you. It's the most applause a reporter for the New York Times is ever going to get at a Republican function. Um, <laughs> But y'all are very kind. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Walter. Um, I'm sitting here with four governors. I think I've probably interviewed all of you separately, so it's kind of neat to have you all on stage together. Uh, although I have to concede that when I thought I'd see the four of you on stage together, it wasn't Aspen I had in mind. It was more like Des Moines uh, 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 here in a few years. You're smiling, Governor, a little bit. You're smiling a little bit. Um, <laughs> but here we are in Aspen, nevertheless. Um, there was a poll uh, that came out yesterday, NBC, Wall Street Journal. 83% uh, of Americans disapproved of the Congress. Obviously, the Congress is uh, the House uh, controlled by the GOP and the Senate by the Democrats. Um, how do you, and let's start here with Governor Jindal, how do you explain that? And I'm not going to bring up each of your approval ratings, uh, but let's, it's safe to say all of you are higher 
uh, than that. Why is the public so down on Congress, and what does that say about Washington generally? Sure. Well, thank you, and thank you, Jonathan, for doing this. You know, Mike and I actually served in, in Congress together. When you get to 83% disapproval, you basically got just friends and family left that like you at that low level. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think the problems in D.C. are structural. I don't think, you know, I think every, every couple of years we think if we just elect a different set of people and a better set of people, they'll get along and they'll solve the country's problems and they'll stop yelling at each other and, and they'll stop trying to blame each other. And nothing changes. And so I'd say two things. One, I think the contrast at the state level, and you've got governors here and you've got governors uh, down there that have got, some of them have Republican majorities, some of them have Democratic majorities, but independent of, of what their legislators are comprised of, they work across party lines to solve problems. Because at the end of the day, we're going to be held accountable. At the end of the day, you can't go to your voters and say, well, I was going to fix the roads, I was going to fix the schools, I was going to fix the economy, but, you know, the mean speaker wouldn't let me get it done. Or, you know, the Senate president stopped my legislation. I think in Congress... Part of the challenge is that both sides, and I'll say this, both Democrats and Republicans feel like it's less important if they win, it's more important that the other side loses. And I think that the only way to fix that is to make some structural changes. And so, for example, I'd like to see, I'd like to see term limits so they have to go back and live under the laws they pass. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see a part-time Congress. People feel like we can't do that. That was the norm for, for several decades, the majority of our country's history. Third, I'd like to see a Congress that has to, like all of these governors, has to balance their budget, can't grow the budget faster than the private sector economy. There are limits on borrowing, has supermajority to raise taxes. Again, things that many of us deal with. Nathan Deal was in the Congress. Butch was in the Congress as well when, when I was there. And then finally, and this is the most radical idea, you know, we pay Congress, and a lot of us pay our legislators per diems. We pay Congress a pretty good salary. I think we should pay them more for every day they don't go to Washington, D.C., rather than every day they do go to Washington, D.C. Uh, Governor Walker, is it just a President Obama problem, or is sort of is this problem also uh, found in your own party in Washington D.C.? Um, does the blame go around? Yeah, uh, two parts. One, I would say uh, Bobby's dead on right, so I'm not going to repeat all the things he said about the structure. It doesn't matter whether it was uh, this president, other presidents, this Congress, or other Congresses. Uh, the one thing I would add, though, per our party. Um, it, there's a clear difference, and you see it amongst the governors the last couple of days talking about it, and even our friends in Washington who are Republicans. When we talk about balancing the budgets, we talk about it through reform. They talk about it through austerity. There's a big difference. Um, austerity isn't inspirational. Uh, it isn't something you strive towards. Uh, it's something that, uh, and if, as long as Republicans in Washington are identified as the accountant party, all, all deference to any accounts here. Um, I, I don't think we go very far. But the reason we have 30 Republican governors, the reason why we have the majority of states in America have Republican legislators uh, in, in the majority, I think is because instead of just talking about austerity, we talk about reform. That reform, in turn, leads us to balance our budgets, and that makes life better. That's one of the key changes I think those in Washington on the Republican side of the aisle need to focus in on. Uh, Governor Pence, you were in Washington for uh, more than a few years. Um, would the public feel better about Congress and Washington generally if Speaker Boehner and President Obama in the summer of 2011 had come to an agreement and, th and there had been a, a large-scale debt and deficit agreement that, that, that passed the Congress that fall? Well, I, I, uh, number one, Jonathan, thank you for doing this. And I want to thank the Institute um, uh, for including me in this, uh, this foursome. Um, I, I, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I do know that people are looking for solutions, not fights. Um, and um, at the state level, um, I, the, the focus that everyone gathered here and other great Republican governors who are here uh, has been in recent years is really is working toward results, working toward solutions. I, in the state of Indiana, uh, for the last eight years and, and, and eight months, we've been on a pathway of fiscal responsibility, economic reform, education reform. Uh, we just passed another honestly balanced budget, uh, uh, paid down debt. We have nearly $2 billion uh, in reserves. We did all of that at a time that we increased funding for roads, increased funding for schools. But, and, and it wasn't easy, even though we have Republican majorities in the House and the Senate. But we came together, and this is my, my one thought in response to your overall question. What was fundamentally different uh, for me from the years I spent 12 years on Capitol Hill uh, to the uh, months that I've spent as governor of Indiana, is that the, the, there's a specious distinction between uh, the federal government and the states in one sense, and that is states can't print money. States have to find a way to make uh, the outgo meet the income. 
And so as leaders, we're obligated to sit down at the table, roll our sleeves up, make hard choices, and prioritize, just like families do, just like businesses do. In Washington, D.C., Jonathan, you know you spent a lot of years out there, and, and you're still covering it from the New York Times. Uh, it's, it's just about uh, what the debt as a percentage of GDP. It seems to be just about adding zeros at this level. It really is about real money and real solutions. And that's why I, I am absolutely convinced uh, that the cure for what ails this country will not come from our nation's capital. It will come from our nation's state capitals. Uh, Governor Christie. Governor Christie, you've uh, not been shy about uh, working across party lines, both in Trenton, but also you've uh, joined President Clinton for, for, for an event in Chicago. You've obviously uh, worked with President Obama uh, on recovery from Hurricane Sandy. Are too many folks in your party afraid of the political uh, optics, to use that, that terrible phrase, uh, that comes with being seen working with people uh, across the aisle, like President Obama, like President Clinton? Is there a bravery deficit, uh, you think, in the party? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's that's a sucker punch, right? You gotta, <laughs> I, you're so brave. Is no one else? Um, uh, yeah, now I won't jump at that one. Here's the thing. I think that there is a, an atmosphere that's been created um, in both parties that discourages working across the aisle. And, and the atmosphere that's been created is, I think, in large measure, one of the things Bobby didn't mention, um, but which I think is key, is the, is the gerrymandering of Congress. Yeah. Um, you know, you no longer do Republicans or Democrats um, in the main, in the 435 districts, have to worry about losing a general election. Right. All they have to do is worry about, you know, getting through a primary. So as a result, um, you know, you will be attacked in a primary. Right if you turn out to be somebody who wants to work with the other side on any issue that you're talking about. But is, does that equal a bravery deficit? You know, I don't think so. Um, I, but, but I think what the difference is between folks in Congress and governors, um, and, and you raised the, the, the issue of me with President Obama, I mean, the fact is you're the governor, uh, a, a disaster that has never hit your state before hits it. And... There are people out there who are thinking about the politics. Let me guarantee you that if you're governor and you have 365,000 homes destroyed and 7, out of, 7 million out of 8.8 .8 million people without power and no operational wastewater or water treatment plants in the state, 51 gas stations open in the right. entire state, and right. none of your schools, let me just tell you, you're not worried about who's going to be happy or sad with you in your party. You got elected to do a job and you do your job. And so my point to finish it, John, is that it's very rare that Congress is faced with that type of crisis. And so when you're faced with a crisis where you have to work with the other side in order to do your job for the people who elected you, you do it. Um, I think presidents are much more, and governors, are much more willing and able to do that if they have the political will. And I believe, in, 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 and I agree with one part of the question you had before, I do think that this president's had a lot to do with it. Because I think the only person in Washington who can bring the parties together is the president of the United States, whoever that president is. If we're waiting for leadership, with all due respect to my friends who have served He hasn't tried enough, you don't think? He hasn't tried enough, you don't think? No, absolutely not. And he didn't try early enough. You know, first impressions matter in these jobs. And if you, in the beginning, come in and, and, and appear to believe that you have all the answers and you're going to jam certain things down people's throats because you have majorities, and you don't care about getting to know John Boehner until right. he becomes speaker, right. well, then that's a problem because guess what? When he becomes speaker, he ain't looking to be your friend because right. you weren't looking to be his when you didn't need him. Well, you raised the issue, Governor, of gerrymandering. <laughs> Governor, you, you raised the issue of gerrymandering, uh, and that, that brings to mind the matter of political incentives which are important in Washington, D.C., and they're certainly important in state capitals. Do the members of Congress, Democrat and Republican, represent your states, speaking of political incentives, do they represent their districts or the primary voters in those districts in terms of how they cast their votes? 
depends on whether in a swing district or or or, or safe. But district. under gerrymandering, it's more and more safe seats. Well, that's though. what I'm saying. The, the, the ones who are in safe districts, I think, not all of them, because you can never say all to everything. Right. But I think in the main. or heritage action going to drop a lot of cash for whoever is running to my right or on the left, uh, you know, to my left. Well, I go back to something Bobby said before, and I've said in the past, um, initially I wasn't there, but I believe term limits are a necessary evil. Uh, I don't care whether it's 8 or 10 or 12, that number is negotiable. Uh, but you think about it, that gets in large part to the issue of the gerrymandering, but it also gets to the larger structural problem. Um, you've got a handful of people, no matter who's in charge, in the Congress who are committee chairs, the speaker, and the other leaders who really control everything. And, and it's not even just a matter of taking a vote up or down. Uh, it's a matter of who drives the agenda, who sets the agenda. I mean, look at, look at Senator Reid, just as an example, for how long they went without even having a budget. Right. And now, again, set aside whether this crowd's Republican or Democrat, how can you not have a budget? Right. I mean, in our states, that's mind-boggling. For, for those of us, whether you have Republican all the way, Democrat one way, a lot of states that are split, again, it's granted it's different, but maybe there's a reason it's different. That's why the states are functional. It's not just because most of us have constitutional amendments that require a balanced budget. Right. We can't print money. It's the whole structural issue that has to fundamentally change if you're going to take Washington back and put the power back in the hands of the people, not of either political party. Right, well, uh, before this becomes a poli-sci lecture about broken Washington, <laughs> let, me, let me shift to the states. Uh, President Obama gave a speech yesterday uh, that I'm sure many of you at least read about uh, in Illinois uh, talking about uh, the economy. Um, this is a, an issue that uh, obviously each of you lives every day. Uh, there are signs of, of you know, growth in the economy. The stock market obviously is doing well, but the job numbers speak for themselves. Uh, in Louisiana, Governor, 7% unemployment. In New Jersey, 8.7%. Indiana, 8.4%. And uh, Governor Walker, you're doing the best at 6.8%. Uh, for a lot of folks in your state, though, those are pretty grim numbers. What are you doing on the ground in your state to improve the, the, the job picture? And wh what is the most important thing that can be done from the standpoint of state government to bolster folks' uh, uh, job prospects? Well, a couple of things. First of all, in Louisiana, look, we're a top 10 state for private sector job growth. Our GDP has grown 50% faster than the national GDP. Per capita income is higher in terms of national... How income. are you doing that, though? How? Well, a couple of things. One, one, I want to talk about what we've done, but secondly, what this president, if he was serious, he talked yesterday about helping the middle class, what he could be doing if he was really serious about that. I think the things we've done in Louisiana are very similar to what many of these Republican governors have done. First year, we got rid of taxes on debt, new equipment, utilities, largest income tax cut in the state's history. We revamped our educational system, You know, something Walter talked about in New Orleans and statewide. 80% of the kids in New Orleans are in charter schools, doubling the percentage doing math, reading on grade level, top-ranked workforce training programs, went from the bottom to the top of the list on ethics rankings because businesses said, we're not going to invest if you've got a bunch of crooks running your, your government, and, and a bunch of other stuff that we removed the, the obstacles for businesses to invest. We've got a record $60-plus billion in announced capital investment projects, and we have the largest ever project in the state's history announced last year. So there are a lot of good things happening. The, the most important statistic, then I want to shift to what the president should have said and could have said yesterday. We've created a predictable environment. If you want to come and invest in Louisiana, your taxes won't go up. I've made the commitment. We're not, we haven't raised any taxes. We won't raise any taxes. We're a business-friendly regulatory environment. It's a safe, predictable environment. And every business CEO and leader I've talked to says, I understand the need for regulations. I just want them to be fair, simple, level, and predictable. And that's what we're offering. After 25 years of losing people, now the only state in the South, for the last five years in a row, we've had people move, more people move into the state. People, I think, are going to migrate to Republican-led and other states that are doing better in this economic recession. It's not really a recovery yet. This is what the president should have said. Think about this. In energy policy, everybody talks about all the jobs created by drilling for oil and gas, and that's great. we got a bunch of them in Louisiana. About one in seven jobs in Louisiana is related to energy. 
We've got tens of billions of dollars in manufacturing plants already announced because of affordable natural gas. This president could shut all of that down with all of his rhetoric on fracking, with his uncertainty on the, the Keystone pipeline, with all of his, uh, his rhetoric on producing more energy at home. And look, we're for renewables in Louisiana. We've got a plant that makes the parts for nuclear power plants. We've got the first biodiesel refinery in the country. We've got a solar tax credit. We build blades for the wind uh, turbines. So we're for all of the above. But on energy, this president's missing an opportunity to resurrect the manufacturing base in our country. Secondly, repeal Obamacare, create predictability. Scott and I did an op-ed today in the Wall Street Journal. The president's a very smart man. It doesn't take a genius to figure out if you want businesses to hire, don't make it more expensive to add on new employees. Don't make it unpredictable. We've all read the stories about companies slowing down hiring, cutting back hours, stopping their expansion plans until they figure out this mess that's Obamacare. He could third. He could say, you know what? I'm going to stop with the class warfare rhetoric. We're not going to tax success. We're not going to over-regulate uh, people that are trying to create jobs. We're going to put a moratorium until we do cost-benefit analysis on new regulations. No more tax increases until the economy is healed. No more tax increases on uh, those that are creating jobs. If he's serious about the middle class, and then fourth and finally, I'll be done. Fourth and finally, portability, let the dollars follow the kids. If he's serious about kids joining the middle class, give every kid a great education. He said a great, he, in his first official State of the Union, he and Bob McDonald who gave the response said the exact same thing. They said that no child's education, no child's future should be determined by their zip code. And they were both right. Unfortunately, his policies haven't matched his rhetoric. He should be for school choice. He should rescue those kids in poor neighborhoods trapped in poor schools. Uh, all right. I'm going to come back to Obamacare. Governor Pence, uh, Governor Pence, you, you recently passed an a, a income tax cut in uh, Indiana. I think it was a little bit more modest than you had hoped originally, but that is life dealing with legislature. Um, what is the sort of tangible evidence that, that, that doing that in your state is going to lead to job creation? Well, let, let me say I think that I, I think the foundation for uh, economic prosperity in Indiana or anywhere else is fiscal responsibility. And so our first priority was to pass an honestly balanced budget, uh, and, and we did that, um, and, and maintaining a record level of reserves, paying down debt. Uh, but I also thought that it was important, even while we were increasing funding for schools, increasing funding for roads, the first new money for roads in Indiana in a decade, I thought it was important that we take a portion of the surplus we'd earned over the last eight years and use it to uh, generate economic growth by allowing Hoosiers to keep more of what they earn. Uh, the tax cut package that we pass when it's fully implemented uh, will be over a billion dollars in tax relief. Uh, we lowered the income tax. We also permanently repealed death taxes in Indiana once and for all. They're gone. Um, <laughs> But it's not just about tax relief. On my first day in office, I signed a moratorium on new regulation. New regulations in Indiana from this year to last year are down 70% in terms of, of, uh, of actual production of red tape. We're doing a full-scale look back. Um, I, I, we've made a significant investment in infrastructure in Indiana. I think roads mean jobs. But the one, the one other idea that we're focused on, our Indiana Career Council will meet for the first time on Monday, is born of my belief that all honest work is honorable work. And I think our schools ought to work just as well for our kids, regardless of where they start in life and regardless of where they want to start in life. And we've made a commitment in Indiana, and we passed it by unanimous, bipartisan uh, support in the House and the Senate to make career and vocational education a priority in every high school in our state again. And I truly believe... I, I truly believe that this is an idea whose time has come. I've had Hoosiers from every walk of life, every political persuasion come up and talk to me about it. I know Nathan Deal's done important spade work in Georgia on this issue. I, I really believe that if we can create a better connection, Jonathan, between secondary education uh, and on a regional basis, the, between, between our schools and the businesses in those areas that are right now in this tough economy finding it difficult to find uh, men and women with the skills and the background to fill the jobs that are available. I think that can be part and parcel of what really unlocks the potential of our state uh, and, and really uh, refires the, the, the industrial engine of the United States of America. And, and again, it's all born of my belief that all honest work uh, all honorable work, uh, honest work is honorable work, and, and, and we ought to make sure our education at every level embraces everything that makes America strong. Governor Christie, uh, Governor, Governor Jindal mentioned 
uh, uh, Obamacare. Has that been an impediment in your state to job creation, or are you seeing evidence of that yet? Sure. How so? Um, and because there's such uncertainty um, in the business community about what it's going to mean for them. And now the, the president has decided he's not going to enforce the employer mandate, um, but he's going to enforce other ones. Are those going to be enforced? He's counting on young people to spend a lot of money on health insurance, which I have no evidence in my state they have any interest in doing. Um, and so what it's created is an entire um, web of uncertainty because they can't even explain how they're going to implement this. I mean, you know, we're not going to have a state-based exchange in New Jersey, and the reason we're not is because the, the administration's approach to us was, um, well, you're not going to control it, even though it's called a state-based exchange, we're going to, and we can't tell you how much it's going to cost you. So now, as a governor, you know, there's one kind of real truism. If you can't control it and you have to pay for it, you should get rid of it. Um, so, and I think that private employers are feeling exactly the same way. And so, uh, I think that, listen, I know that this is important to the president, and I know he believes it's his legacy. I just wonder what kind of legacy it's going to turn out to be. We may not disagree on the fact that it's going to be his legacy. And this is what happens. You talked about bipartisanship before. Yeah. And this is what happens when you use parliamentary maneuvers to jam a absolute sea change in American life down the throats of the American people with bare majorities and not one Republican vote. You cannot tell me that if the president had worked at it, that he couldn't have crafted a plan, because you see it in states. You see in places like Utah where they had their own exchanges well before. He could have worked to do that. He chose not to because he thought this was going to be his legacy, and I think it's going to wind up being a sad legacy. Now, <laughs> Governor, you accepted the Medicaid expansion in your state. It, I think Governor Brewer is here. She was here at least. She also accepted the Medicaid expansion. Uh, many governors on your side of the aisle have not done that. Why did you choose to do the Medicaid expansion? Because it was best for my state. Yeah. But you vetoed a bill recently that would have been enshrined permanently, though, right? Right, because that would be stupid. <laughs> Expound, I mean, please. Because, because, because here's the thing. What I said when I agreed to, to expand Medicaid was, first of all, we have the second most generous Medicaid program in the country already. And so the expansion of Medicaid for us was minor in terms of the numbers of new people that will be covered compared to what we already have. Secondly, we're paying for a lot of things now ourselves that now the federal government will come back and pick up not at 50%, but at 90%. And if I don't make it permanent, if the federal government ever does what they did in the special education arena when they initially said they're going to pay a You're huge amount of You're on the hook for it. it. I'm on the hook if I make it permanent. What I've told the administration is this. I'm going to continue to do this for the people of our state as long as it's advantageous for those who get the coverage and for our taxpayers. It is now. Right. The day that they go below 90% on the reimbursement, I'm out. Well, speaking of uh, state issues uh, that you guys are dealing with, uh, where the, the federal government could offer some, some clarity, uh, at least, uh, immigration. Uh, I want to get all of you on this. Uh, start with Governor Walker. Uh, oh, would you have supported the uh, immigration bill that, that passed the Senate, Governor? No, why not? Well, I haven't taken a position at all because I wasn't elected to Congress. Right. Um, I've got enough problems in the state of Wisconsin, yeah. but I will tell you, even though I haven't endorsed any of the plans out there, uh, I've said that this is a classic example of Washington not being able to understand problems. They take a, the, a symptom of the problem instead of addressing it. Mm -hmm. The bigger issue in, in the United States is we have a broken system for legal immigration. If we have a problem where people, I don't care whether they come from Mexico or Canada or Ireland or Germany or anywhere else, we have a system that doesn't work today. The federal government, even in the recent discussions in the Senate and elsewhere, <clears throat> is ignoring that reality. Right. We need to fix the system there so that people who want to come into this state or into this country, I should right. say, legally can do so. And just to be clear, so you, if you were in the Senate, you would have opposed the bill? I, I, I'm not in the Senate, so I'm not elected to take that position. I'm not skipping it. I'm just saying... To me, the system is broken. It is a classic example. What we talked about before what's wrong with Washington yeah. is they're taking a symptom of the overall problem, right. the overall problem in America. And people, everybody here has people we know 
not just from Mexico. That's the big over uh, focus here. It's not just on Mexico. Folks it's visas in, that are it's uh, everywhere. Overstayed. I mean, right, talk right. to Google and Microsoft. Right. They repeatedly point out they can't get enough high tech positions in because we have a failed immigration system for people who want to come in this country legally. It is an economic issue that needs to be fixed. But instead, we talk about it just for one section of it instead of dealing with the overall problem. That is a classic example of Washington not solving the real issue before us. Uh, Governor Pence, should there be some kind of a pathway to legal status for those who are in the country currently who are legal here? Well, Jonathan, you, you may remember, no one here I expect would, that um, uh, in 2006 with Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, I, I, I co-authored uh, what I thought was a, uh, a broad-based, no amnesty guest worker program that put border security first. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan said it well, a nation without borders is not a nation. And so uh, I think there is a broad expectation of the American people that we would make a, a serious investment using technology and, and infrastructure to secure our borders. But I think part of that border security, as I talked to border agents uh, back when I was involved in that issue, uh, I, I met with border agents in, in Texas and in Arizona and in California. Every single one of them said, if you want to control the border, you have to have a coherent, modern guest worker program that allows people uh, when the, the, the economy of our country needs it, allows people to come in and do the work in agriculture and in other sectors and to be able to leave the country under the color of law. Our proposal was that you contract with private sector American um, uh, employment placement firms to operate these centers. Um, uh, you remember the late Charlie Norwood, Nathan, who called them Ellis Island centers. The congressman from and Georgia. They could be, they, that's right. And they could be operated uh, uh, by companies like Kelly Services and Monster.com. You know, Phil Graham said famously, you know, there's no, no problem in the world too complicated that can't be fixed if somebody can make a buck fixing it. Uh, and going to these companies that manage employment placement today and asking them to manage a guest worker program dealing with the issue that we have today and setting aside, and, I, and I'm, I'm not ducking either, but setting aside the question of amnesty and saying, let's get a hold of our border. Part of how we get a hold of our border is we utilize 21st century technologies and methodologies and systems to create a coherent guest worker program. And when we do that... I A lot of the things that I think, you know, and, and I've read about the Senate bill and have some familiarity with it, but as Scott said, not nearly as much as I would need to, to be able to, to, to say would I vote yes or no. But I will tell you, I think they missed a lot of opportunities. I think, uh, you know, Senator Cornyn's amendment on border security was a much smarter way to go um, on border security than where they eventually went. I think Senator Portman's amendment on E-Verify and making that stronger and more broadly required would have been a much smarter way to go. You need to provide people with confidence that the system's gonna be fair. And that means everybody, John. It doesn't mean just um, uh, folks who are living in this country, American citizens. It's also those people who are here, the 11, 12 million you're talking about. You know, the fact is that we have to be fair to them also. And, and allowing the system to continue as it is, as Scott talked about, in the broken way that it is now, is negative for America's economy, and it's also bad for these folks who now have had children in this country, and some of them grandchildren in this country. And we're not being fair to them either. So, you know, we need to have the complete conversation and get it done. I don't believe it's something that should be done piecemeal. I think we need to have the whole conversation and get it done. Governor General, you are opposed to the Senate bill, I know. Um, let me ask you about the politics of it. Uh, Congressman Steve King gets a, uh, a lot of attention for saying that are very provocative things. Uh, he's done that again recently. Uh, as, as, as you know, the son of immigrants, uh, do those kinds of comments hurt the image of your party? And how, if you don't do an immigration bill, putting the policy aside, how do you address the politics of the perception of the Republican Party among minorities in this country? Absolutely, the, rhetoric, the, the language hurts. And I was proud. His that, language. His language. And I was proud that the leadership quickly came out and said, 
that doesn't represent the party. Now, you know, look, I got a, a lot of attention last year for calling out some of the, the dumb comments that people said from our party. I said, we got to stop being the stupid party. Because when people hear that kind of language, I'm not sure everybody heard the, the, the comments. I mean, and I just don't think that's helpful. Now, he's a good guy. He's a friend. But let's get back to, the, let's get back to your question. First about the substance, then about the, the politics of it. On the substance, real quickly, you know, I thought the Senate bill, I would have voted no. I thought that it was a typical Washington. They don't solve the problem. A thousand pages, a lot of pork. It reminded me of a lot of the problems with Obamacare. It's real simple. It's not complicated. I, I think you heard Mike and others say this. First step, secure the border. And when I say secure the border, I don't mean according to the bureaucrats. I'm saying let the border state governors vote on it. Let the members of Congress vote on it. And then once you've secured the border, it's not hard to do. Everybody talks about it. It's easy. It's doable. Secondly, once you've done that, you've got to make, you've got to provide an easy, quick uh, way for those that are here, those 11, 12 million, to become legal, deport those that are criminals, those that want to become legal, let them become legal. Don't let them go on to different welfare programs. There should be a significant wait before they can then apply for citizenship. When they apply for citizenship, make sure they want to learn how to speak English. They want to assimilate. They pay their taxes. But here's the bottom line when it comes to, to immigration and those that are here. People that want to come here and work here, people that want to come here and get an education here, we should absolutely want them in America, not only because it's good for them, it's good for America. We should do it for selfish reasons, not just compassionate reasons. I think it's good for our economy and it's good for our society. Politically, I think for our party, we, and you heard several speakers throughout this week talk about this, we've got to be the party that says we welcome those entrepreneurs, we welcome those families, we welcome those who want to work here and contribute to the economy. That's the American dream, and some of them, some of them have that, that passion for the American dream we're trying to teach our kids because they've lived it and they know that they can't get that American dream in other countries. One final point, we could solve all our problems if we just let a lot more, I know Nikki Haley would agree this, if we just let a lot more Indians in this country, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking. He got, the, he got the South Asian plug in there. All right. <laughs> Noted. Uh, Governor Walker, uh, you were a former uh, county executive in Milwaukee County, uh, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, obviously whites there, a lot of Germans. Um, I know you feel strongly about trying to broaden the face of the Republican Party. I want to read you a stat that really jumped out to me. A Washington Post ABC News poll taken in the wake of the uh, Zimmerman uh, trial. 86% of African Americans say blacks and other minorities do not get equal treatment under the law. The number of whites saying the same thing is 41%. What's happening in this country where you see such divergent views in terms of, in the year 2013, African Americans, 86% think that blacks and other minorities don't get equal treatment under the law. Does that bother you? Sure, it bothers me. In terms of the answer, I, I can't tell you. I, I don't know that. Uh, I mean, I talk to folks in my state about issues like that, but I can't give you a precise explanation for that. But I can tell you, and it goes back to the question you just asked Bobby about the future of this party, or at least the leaders in this party, because I think it's broader than just, it's not the Republican National Committee. It's people running for office at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. And, and that is, I, I think we need one of the best lessons to, to bring in not only more ethnic minorities, to bring in more folks who've come into this country as immigrants, to bring in more young people, more young women, more working class families, is to talk in terms that are much more aspirational. That's, what, that's why we have 30 Republican governors. As governors, we talk in terms that are much more optimistic about the future. We talk in terms that are much more relevant, and we, we show that we've got that passion with the courage. And I'll give you an example of that in the relevance, talking about race relations. Um, to being relevant, means not talking about sequesters and fiscal cliffs and all the things they talk about in Washington. It's talking about how you make your kids' schools better. Uh, how do you make it uh, uh, so that in your state, in your community, in your country, that the neighbor down the block who's been out of work for the last six or seven months has an opportunity to get a job in the private sector and get back on their feet again. How your, your grandchildren who are in college studying to get a degree are actually going to be able to get a job in the community they want to live in, in the degree, in the area that they studied in. Those are things that we as governors talk about that more people in our party need to be talking about nationally. And part of that relevance, though, isn't just talking in relevant terms. It's going to places. And you mentioned being a Milwaukee County Executive. The last time I was up for re-election in 2008, same year as Barack Obama carried about two-thirds of the vote in my county. Uh, I took about 60% of the vote in a county that's never elected a Republican before, that has an overwhelming minority influence in it, particularly in the city of Milwaukee, and I carried every one of the Hispanic wards in the south side of Milwaukee. The reason was simple. Immigration wasn't an issue at the local level. Two big things I was involved in were, were two big drivers for Hispanic votes for me. Small business entrepreneurship, I wasn't just out there talking about it. I went out to where entrepreneurs were and helped Hispanic entrepreneurs get up and going. And the other big thing in my state was school choice. 
uh, that a lot of our families, particularly in the city of Milwaukee, were not satisfied with the quality of education they got from the public school system. I wasn't just out there. I went um, to Notre Dame Academy High School. I went uh, to, uh, to all the other schools that were voucher schools in the south side of Milwaukee, and I talked to those parents, and we got that voucher expansion, and that's what they really cared about. More than any of these national issues, it comes right down to, if you talk about their ability to, to employ people to start right. their own businesses and to look out for their children, those are the issues. But as Republicans, yeah. we need to be out there showing, not just talking, yeah. but going to places uh, where those groups of voters are at and showing we care about it. Uh, Governor Pence, uh, let me ask you a question up about, uh, not, not uh, ethnicity, but about class. Uh, your party has lost the popular vote for the last five elections. There is a so-called blue wall of states in this country that vote for Democrats for president and have been doing the same thing since 1992. Uh, part of the challenge is that your party is seen as the party of the rich. And I don't have to remind the gentleman on this stage, your last nominee for, for president, uh, reinforced that uh, during the course of the campaign last year a few times. How do you, how do you shake that uh, and win back the White House in 2016, that notion that your party represents the privileged, the rich, the few in this country? Well, I think um, stereotypes notwithstanding, and, and, I, and I understand that, um, that, uh, that, that those, those cliches exist. I, I think the real answer here uh, for our party going forward and, and for our party being a part of the answer for the country um, is that all of us ought to understand in the jobs that we hold is that we serve all of the people. When I raised my right hand and took my oath of office in January in Indiana, I said my ambition is nothing less than to be the governor of all the people of Indiana. And what Scott Walker just said really, really spoke to my heart. Um, and, and that is, uh, I, I, I think that, with notable exceptions on this stage around me, uh, that our, our party has been guilty in the last 20 years of simply not showing up. Showing up where we haven't been showing up. I, 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 mean, I mean, what does I'm that mean? Not, look, does that mean union halls? Does that mean the, uh, look, I'm know, the, NAACP? I'm the, What's that mean? Look, I'm, 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 I joined, I've started out in politics as a Youth Democrat Party coordinator in Columbus, Indiana in 1975. And then I, I heard the voice of a man who also started his career as a Democrat uh, in Ronald Reagan, and I became a Republican. I was drawn to the Republican Party. Uh, and, and in fact, in the 1980s, the, the number of Americans who identified themselves as Republicans actually doubled, and, and I think that was because we talked about our ideas in that time, and we, and, and, and particularly personified not only in the 40th president, but in, in people like, uh, a, a man who I was privileged to know, Jack Kemp, uh, we understood that, that our ideals know no race, no creed, no color. These, these are solutions. When you put them into practice, they will create jobs and opportunities and prosperity and better schools for every American. And, but all of it begins with what Scott Walker was saying, and, and that is um, uh, generating leadership, like, frankly, you see here, uh, that's being... He's pointing to Governor Christie. That, well, it's being borne out in, in his election this year. Well, he's, I want to ask about that. He's been endorsed by some, some, a very broad coalition of people in New Jersey, and I, I think it is born of the fact that, that he and the other uh, leaders on this stage, and hopefully my aspiration in my career, is that we're showing up, we're carrying our message of optimism and opportunity to every American. That's how our party wins. More importantly, that's how America wins. Jonathan? Yes, sir. And, I apologize for jumping on order. We're going to turn over to Chris in a second, but I'm going to say something about Chris. I want to challenge the premise of your question. Please. I just think you're wrong. I think, look, think about this for a second. You talked about um, the party and, and the perception of the right. party. There are definitely challenges. But what, what do these states have in common? Wisconsin, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, Virginia, New Mexico, uh, Nevada. Right. Those are all states that were so-called, by you guys in the media, battleground states. Every one of them Barack Obama carried. Right. What do they all have in common? Republican governors. They all have Republican governors. Respectfully. Now, 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 and you take it a step further, and not a battleground state, but New Jersey, where he not only won in 2009, but 
uh, short of, and don't get any ideas, a truck hitting them on the way out, uh, Chris is on track to win in New Jersey with, I think, unprecedented support not only from Republicans but from Democrats as well. What that says is, particularly in times of crisis, and we are in an economic and fiscal crisis in this country and in each of our individual states, what people want more than anything isn't just Republican or Democrat, they want leadership. And we're providing leadership, and that's what we need out of our national ticket. All right. I'm going to come to Governor Christie in a minute, but respectfully, Governor, this is a smart room, and they recognize that there was a massive national wave in 2009 and 2010 that lifted your party across the board uh, that hadn't been seen really for a long, long time in American politics. That's part of the reason why you've got Republican governors in those states. But, but I would contend, I don't want to replay the 12 election, the but I still contend in my state, if, if Mitt Romney had made the R next to his name like I did stand for reformer right. instead of rich guy who only cares about rich guys, Mitt Romney would have carried Wisconsin and every other one of those battleground states. He didn't make the connection that Republican governors are making over and over across right. America. That's not about party. That's about the candidate. Uh, Governor Christie, uh, you are up for re-election this year. Uh, you are in certainly a very blue state. hasn't gone for Republicans since 88, I think, uh, when H.W. Bush carried it. Um, how is it that you are able to uh, enjoy the, the numbers that you do? Part of that, obviously, is the response to Hurricane Sandy, but it's not entirely that. You've got voters in your state who are culturally much more liberal than you are. You're anti-abortion. It's more of a, a pro-abortion right state. Um, what is it that, that you do or that you say that, that makes people there okay with voting for a Republican when they wouldn't do the same on the national level? Charm and good looks. <laughs> Don't ever discount it, man. Don't ever discount it. Um, <clears throat> now, listen, it's a, it's a concerted effort. And good shtick, too, by the way. Good shtick. Don't shortchange that, either. Um, it's a concerted effort. And it's patience. You see, I, I think that we're in an instant gratification society. In, in, in most ways. And so, if you're a Republican, and you go to campaign in an African-American neighborhood. And if the next election, you don't win a large number of African-American votes, uh, too often our party said, all right, well, the hell with it. Um, move on. Go back to the suburbs. But when you pass bills, Governor, in some states where you try to curtail Sunday voting, where you try to limit voting opportunities on election day itself, that well, reinforces well, a certain perception, well, doesn't listen, it? Well, listen, you know, I mean, that's... Is gonna, that helpful that, to the cause? That's gonna, I think it's relatively irrelevant to the cause um, because of this. You know, part of what you need to do is to be there every day, not just on election day. Your question focuses on election day and what are the rules and what are the, the, the parameters around election day. But if you wait as a Republican for election day um, to try to broaden the base, you're, you're not going to. And listen, it's, it's, it's a fact that these issues do matter, but the only way that the issues matter is if you show up and have the courage to articulate them. Um, I'll give you two quick examples. First, um, in 2009, um, the Building Trades Council in New Jersey, the 15 Building Trades, endorsed John Corzine and the president of the Building Trades in his speech, not only endorsed John Corzine, but said, we are gonna kick Chris Christie's ass from one end of the turnpike to the other. Um, they went all in. Um, two weeks after I was sworn in as governor, I invited all 15 heads of the Building Trades to the governor's mansion for breakfast. And I sat across from the Building Trades guys, they didn't think the gate was gonna open when he pulled up. It did. And I said to them pretty simply, here's the deal. You guys are getting screwed uh, because you are just going in one direction and you're just supporting one party. And I'm ready to work with you to try to build jobs and put your members back to work. I don't care that you worked against me the last time, but if we do our job the right way, you'll work for me the next time. And we now have broad building trade support because we've created jobs in the state um, over the last four years and a lot of their members are back to work and they're seeing results. Second. Um, I'm not gonna use my words, I'll use the words of somebody who endorsed me a few weeks ago. Um, I've been working hard on the, on the issue, as many of these guys have up here, on education reform and an educational choice. And it is a powerful, powerful issue.
endorsed me a couple weeks ago. And the pastor of the New Hope Baptist Church stood up and said this at the endorsement. He said, For, since 1965, black pastors have stood in the pulpit of black churches and told them one thing, go to the polls and vote Democrat. And you would think that after 45 years of that type of loyalty that we would have safe streets and great schools, and we have neither. And so my message today for African-American voters in New Jersey is, we have a choice. Well, that didn't happen overnight, John. And I didn't convince this guy to stand up and say those things because of the charm and good looks. It was because I was willing to stand with him and work with him, even though he'll work against me on other issues. So if we as a party want to broaden our base, we have to do two things. As Mike said, first, we got to show up. And then second, we got to listen. We have to listen to the folks in those neighborhoods and not turn them away with rhetoric like the kind of rhetoric you were referencing before, yeah. which is divisive, comment. which is divisive and destructive to people's ability to be willing to join our club. But respectfully, it's not just rhetoric. And the fact is, African Americans and Hispanics, looking at the polling data, overwhelmingly support Obamacare. So you guys have a policy issue there too, don't yeah. you? Guess what? Here's a newsflash for you, John. We're not going to agree on everything. If you want a candidate that you're going to agree with all the time, go home and look in the mirror because you're the only person you agree with <laughs> all the time. So, and, 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 open, and open-minded, right-thinking people in this country say, I'm not going to agree with, that, with a candidate on every issue, but I'm going to pick the issues that I care about the most, and then I'm going to go with the candidate who agrees with me the most and who I trust. And so in the end, that's the problem with politicians, is they worry about that question and try to be everything to everybody. Here's the key in my state in the end. I can guarantee you that there are a lot of people in my state who don't agree with me on much, let alone on everything. But what they know is, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And when I say I won't, I won't. And that's what Scott was talking about before. People do want a certain amount of certainty to their leadership. And that makes a difference no matter what color you are, no matter how much you make, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, they want some certainty in leadership. I'm going to ask one more question of the group, and I'm going to put it to the crowd for some real fair and balanced uh, questions. Um, but something on my mind, I think it's also on the mind of, uh, of the audience. I, I was struck, uh, the lead story in my own paper today was, was on the vote last night in the House uh, on the NSA issue. And there were a lot of conservative Republicans uh, who were uh, in league with uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, and there were a lot of liberal Democrats who were in a league with a lot of conservative Republicans. Putting aside the, at the NSA issue and you know, PRISM and all that, more broadly, I want to hear from all of you on this. Is your party becoming more libertarian? Do you see that at the grassroots? And is that a challenge or an opportunity for you going forward, given the fact that your base is very culturally conservative? Sure. No, absolutely. I think you're seeing more and more expressions, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, and I think that's always been a strong part of the party's base, uh, this libertarian streak. I think, in part, it's a reaction to the president. Now, you look at some of the scandals that have come out recently, whether it was the AP reporters, whether it was Benghazi, whether it was the IRS, now it's the NSA controversy. You know, you can look at them and say, oh, they're all independent scandals and, and disconnected. I think they're actually symptoms of what happens when you've got an, a large, intrusive government. This president, I think in his bones, just to give credit to his ideology and his core beliefs, he really does believe in a bigger, more intrusive, more expensive government involved in our lives. You see it manifested in, in trivial and silly thing, things like the debate in New York City about whether you can buy a big gulp and in, in more profound ways where a president says, I want the government running health care. I want the government telling you how to live your lives. I, I think fundamentally he doesn't trust the American people enough. I think as a reaction to that, you've got a lot of voters in the Republican Party, independents, swing voters who are saying, you know, I'm tired of the government telling me how to live my life, and, and I do want more freedom, and I do want the ability to be left alone and, and live my life the way I want, spend the money the way I want, raise my kids the way that I want. I think it's a strong reason why school choice is so popular across party lines. So I think in part this libertarian uh, revival that you're seeing is in, in some ways in a response to a president who ideologically believes in a bigger government 
And what we have seen is the incompetence of a larger government. And I think you are seeing, I think this country is built on the foundation of freedom. I think that pendulum is swinging back. I think the American people are saying one of the things that makes us such a great and exceptional country is the government can't tell you how to live your life. So I do think that pendulum Governor is swinging Walker, back. you and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, issues like same-sex marriage and abortion, uh, views do tend to be different among younger voters. Um, you've seen that in your own state, and I think in your, old, your own household, mm -hmm. too. Uh, how does the Republican Party uh, win younger voters in 2060 and beyond who have a, a more laissez-faire approach to the issue of, of, of for example, gay marriage? Yeah, I, I think there, there's, a, there's a shift uh, overall in the party, and I think it's particularly, you said, uh, younger people. I've got one of my two sons who are in college here with me today, and I think talking to him and a lot of his fellow students, uh, there, there is more of a shift towards a I guess you'd call it libertarian, kind of a free market uh, uh, approach overall. I, I, we missed the opportunity last year. I think we can make this uh, appeal going forward that would help with those young people. It would help with a lot of other groups we talked about before. It's real simple. Uh, we can define the fact that the president and his allies, be it in the federal government and the states, measure success in government by how many people are dependent in the government. How many people are on unemployment? How many people are on food stamps? How many of people are on Medicaid? We, as a contrast, should measure success by just the opposite, by how many people are no longer dependent on the government. But here's the difference. And I thought one of the missed opportunities with the infamous 47% argument was that it's one of the misunderstandings out there is there's a tipping point, but the vast majority of people who are temporarily dependent on the government today don't want to be. And so the argument we should make is we measure success by how many people are no longer dependent on the government. Not because we want to kick them to the curve or push them out in the cold, but because we understand that true freedom and prosperity doesn't come from the heavy hand of the government. It comes with the dignity that comes from work, and that's about empowering people. And that's something I think not just young people or libertarian-leaning people. Uh, I think it's not even just a conservative Republican principle. That's fundamentally an American principle. As a kid, I don't remember anybody growing up in my class that said to me, Scott, my goal is someday when I grow up I want to become dependent on the government. Instead, what they said was, I want to live the American dream. It's the same reason immigrants come here from other countries. They want to live the American dream, and that means self-determination. Give me the opportunity, but don't force the outcome. It's why in America, we take a day off to celebrate the 4th of July and not the 15th of April, because in America, we value our independence from the government, not our dependence on it. All right. I, I got to move this thing. Governor Pence, uh, cultural libertarianism, national security libertarianism, is, is that a, a, a challenge to the Republican coalition, do you think, going forward? How do, you, how do you keep folks in the coalition who have very different views on national security and cultural issues with uh, the, the, lots of folks in the party? Well, I, I, I want to agree with Scott that I, I, don't, I don't think that um, the commitment to, to personal freedom, to libertarian thought is... is is a new phenomenon in American politics or in Republican politics, um, and uh, and I think it I think whether it's the debate that occurred last night in connection with that legislation or, or otherwise, I think it is it is uh, it is healthy and and uh, and welcome always uh, because when you're dealing with issues of national security, and I was I was uh, on the Judiciary Committee when we crafted many of the bills over the last 12 years. Uh, that, that responded to the attack on our country in 2001. There always is that careful balancing between taking those actions necessary to protect the American people from harm and, 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 and carefully weighing that against a, the vigorous American commitment to personal liberty and to privacy. And uh, with, with regard to your, your broader question about young people, I'm just in, encouraged to hear that my family's not that different from Scott Walker's family. Um, <laughs> In terms of diversity of thought, yeah. um, and um, and I, I think for me, it, it, at least going forward, when I talk to young people, including our three kids, uh, it's about respect and authenticity in this generation. Mm. Uh, it's about are, are, are you are you a leader? And, I, and I'm someone I'm conservative, but I'm not in a bad mood about it. You know, I I. Um, <laughs> I try and just get up every day, let my yes be yes and my no be no, and, and, and whether it's my family or the six and a half million people I serve, they know where I stand. But are we communicating in a way that, res that expresses profound respect for the dignity of every person that we serve? Are we doing, are, you know, are, are we always prepared to give a reason for our ideas, but as the old book says, to do so with gentleness and respect? That, that 40th president 
uh, who I had the opportunity to meet once as a young candidate for Congress. My one takeaway and my one encounter with Ronald Reagan was what a gentle man he was to speak to. I think Sam Donaldson said memorably, that, working in your line of work, Jonathan, he said, disagreeing with President Reagan on everything, he said he, quote, is an impossible man to dislike <laughs> because he was profoundly respectful uh, of people and he cherished the American people. But pr the other piece is authenticity. I think in this Internet age that we live in and smartphones, I'm telling you what, and I don't think my kids are any different than anybody else's kids or grandkids. This generation can smell a phony a mile off. <laughs> and, and, I, and my sense is that to the extent that we produce leaders at every level uh, who are men and women who are authentic, who are who they are, who are not pandering to people, but are providing leadership according to the, the, their, their best lights, I think we can win younger Americans and we can win Americans my age and we can win older Americans. It's respect and authenticity that can be a platform for, for victory. I truly believe that. All right, Governor Christie. <laughs> Governor Christie, your first vote, uh, your first vote was for, for Reagan, I understand, when you were in college. You, you don't have a son in college. I do. Uh, what do you hear from him on, on politics? How does he view the world? And does he have more of a libertarian perspective? And what do you, I mean, what do you hear back from him? Well, first of all, for, for me, Mary Pat, our general philosophy on this is there's no use in having children if you can't brainwash them. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't understand what Pence and Walker are talking about in terms of diversity of opinion. <laughs> if they want to eat, it's not tolerated in our house. So... Uh, now, Governor, I'm not going to reveal the college that your son goes to because this is being live streamed. Well, he's a lonely man. But it's not a it, it's not Oral Roberts University. It, it's not it's a right not a bastion of conservatism <laughs> at Princeton. No, um, I know. You know, listen, he's in the Princeton Republican Club. They they meet in the closet, and um, <laughs> but they have fun. Um, no, what I, what I hear, listen, what I hear from what I hear from Andrew um, is is that what his friends, when they do talk about politics, um, that what they talk about um, is how broken it is. And, you know, how they wish that people would be nicer to each other. Um, my children, um, as, as observers of politics, are offended by the tone of politics right now. Now, politics is never easy, and I try to explain to them that. You can whether you talk to yourself, though, Governor. Oh, damn right. Um, <laughs> But, but listen, what I try to explain to them is that politics, like any other business, um, is, is sometimes tough and difficult. But I think what they're offended by is the, and what they talk about is the personal nature of it um, and, and how it's not good enough just to say you disagree. You have to say the other person's a bad person and has ill motives and ill will. And I think that if what we really want, and, and I think what these young people want, is to want to go into government and not have to sacrifice their dignity for it. And so, and on the libertarianism side of things, I, as, a, as a former prosecutor and, and who was appointed um, by President George W. Bush on September 10th, 2001, um, I just want us to be really cautious because this strain of libertarianism that's going through both parties right, right now and, and making big headlines, I think is a very dangerous thought. Uh, President Obama has done nothing to change the policies of the Bush administration in the war on terrorism, and I mean practically nothing. And you know why? Because they work. Because they work. And I think what we have a country has to decide is, uh, do we have amnesia? Because I don't. And I remember what we felt like on September 12, 2001. And have there been some mistakes made over the course of time? Of course, because it's human beings and their judgment calls. There have been some mistakes made. But I, I want to say that I think both the way President Bush conducted himself and the way President Obama has conducted himself in the main on those type of decisions hasn't been different because they were right and because we haven't had another one of those um, attacks that cost thousands and thousands of lives. And as the governor now of a state, that lost the second most people on 9-11
behind the state of New York right. and still seeing those families, John. Right. I, I love all these esoteric debates that people are getting in. Senator um, Rand Paul, for example. Well, listen, you can name any number of people who have, who have engaged in it, and he's one of them. I mean, these esoteric intellectual debates, I want them to come to New Jersey and sit across from the widows and the orphans and have that conversation. And, and, and they won't. Because that's a much tougher conversation to have. So as a country, and whoever's the leader so of this country... the response country, to Obama being in the White House, do you think... No, I don't this, think so. ...this drift I, towards libertarianism? No, I don't think so. But I think, but I think he started to cause it. I don't think it's because, in reaction to him. But he had a lot of rhetoric in 2008. He was going to close Guantanamo. He was going to stop this. He was going to stop that. And I remember I used to say to Mary Pat all the time, as somebody who had top secret clearance, I said, well, man, when he sits in that chair and starts to hear those briefings, his tune's going to change fast. And it has. Mm -hmm. And so for those of us who are on the front line of it, for those of us who are on the front line of that in the years after that, the U.S. attorneys, the FBI, the CIA, the people who are on the front line of trying to keep this country safe, I just say it's not a debate not worth having. But I think we need to be very cautious about how joyful we are over the idea that somehow we're going to shift this baby way back because the next attack that comes that kills thousands of Americans as a result, people are going to be looking back on the people who are having this intellectual debate and wonder whether or not they put what our first job is, all of us, is to... should have. Uh, and I think that what you heard is even the people that voted for, I'm sorry, against the, the amendment uh, on the winning side right. yesterday, last night, said, look, we do need to come back and look at these programs, make sure they're being properly run. But Chris is also right that at the end of the day, the, one of the president's most solemn and, and first obligations is to keep us secure. All of us are, are I think, conservative, small government uh, Republicans, but we all agree that our first responsibility is to protect the security of our the people we represent, we work for. So I think it's a good debate worth having, but I think we cannot have amnesia. I don't think we can go back and remove those programs. Let's have the proper oversight. Let's make sure they're not being abused. Let's make sure they're not. And I think, and I do think, and I'll close with this. I do think the fact that this administration abused the authority of the IRS to go after conservative groups. Look, that's why I've been a fierce critic of this president. If you'd asked me a couple of years ago, would he do that? I would have said, absolutely not. This that's a line they wouldn't cross. The fact they crossed that line, I do think, makes people skeptical of this administration. All right, last, Governor Walker and Governor Pence, are you troubled by the drift towards what we'll call Paulism in the party? I, I don't think, I think on other issues like health care and the question of whether or not the federal government should be controlling yeah. health care for us and our families, I think there's a shift more towards a libertarian yeah. viewpoint. I don't see that shift. I see a few loud and vocal people talking about it in Washington. I don't on think security, that's, on security, you mean. Uh, on the security, and I don't necessarily think that reflects the where the rest of the party is. And, and I would just add one thing to what Chris said. I, I just welcome back, as these other governors have done as well, uh, members of the 229th uh, that returned from being deployed a year in Afghanistan. And much like Chris talked about with those uh, family members from, from the 9-11 tragedy, when I see those men and women coming back and you think about the commitment that we have just in a small scale as chief of st or commanders and chiefs of our own National Guard, I can only imagine what the president feels in that regard. There is a serious, serious commitment to protecting our national security, and I tend to agree with Chris on that. All right, Governor Pence, we'll finish with you. I, I'm, I'm never troubled by open debate about the challenges of protecting the people of the United States of America and protecting the liberties of the people of the United States of America. Um, but, but I think, as Chris expressed, and we all expressed, it's, it's extremely important that, that we, we remember that unless we take such actions and, and make tough decisions necessary to protect the people of the United States, then their, their liberties are meaningless if their lives are at risk. And, and having been there when we, we wrote the Patriot Act, uh, that we put sunset provisions in it, we, there was an expectation that we, it would be reviewed on a regular basis with the idea of protecting the privacy and the personal liberty of the American people. So I, I welcome the debates, 
Uh, it, but, but I do believe that it's, a, it's absolutely essential that we understand that on September the 11th, in so many ways, the world changed for the American people. And part of leadership is reminding the American people of, of the dangers that we face every day and the tools that our intelligence community, that our uh, domestic law enforcement uh, and, and others charged with protecting our nation need to prevent not respond, okay. but to prevent yeah. another attack on All our right. country of that nature. Uh, unless one of the four of you wants to rule out running for president, I'm not going to ask that question. So you have your chance here. All right, go on. Uh, I promised, I promised Q&A, but we, I think I'm getting the hook here from Walter Isaacson, and if I don't follow Walter Isaacson's directions, I can never set foot in New Orleans again. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to follow his dictate. I apologize about that. But uh, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, have a great night.